so when Sephon looks at your bi biography, um, it's really difficult to pick a point where to start, and it's like almost uh, yeah, the history of dance music in the last what is it now, 2007? Yeah. So the last more than 30 years. So maybe you could just start at the start. <laughs> okay, <laughs> in the beginning. Uh, actually, uh, I started uh, DJing uh, when I was uh, 13 years old. And uh, my mixer had no headphone jack, no controls. You had two RCA jacks in the back and if you wanted to try mixing, you'd put your head down near the <laughs> headphone, uh, near the uh, turntable, and you'd uh, try and uh, hear where the breaks were, which actually served me very well later in my career because, you know, you'd be talking to someone in your booth and you'd lose your place and you'd know exactly where the break was, so you could just mix uh, right into it. Uh, the, uh, I started working in, in, uh, in record retail around the same time, um, my father uh, has a, an incredible record collection, uh, so all the inspiration I have being in the business comes from from him. So, what what kind of stuff was in your father's collection? Oh, you name it, Every, everything, including opera. Um, I can remember "Love in C Minor" by Sarone coming out, or uh, "Love to Love You, Baby," and uh, you know, obviously, those records were were pretty uh, edgy I in their time, and uh, him defending defending my taste in music against my sisters who, who just, you know, weren't into it at all. Um, but, uh, you know, there's everything in his collection from Nat King Cole to Johnny Mathis to, you know, USA European Connection, Sarone, Donna Summer, Giorgio Moroder, um, you name it, it's in there. And actually this morning I was missing something and I called him and he's looking for it now. He probably has it. So your father is still into music and buying stuff? Yes, uh, and um, you know, as we go through today's conversation, I mean, I travel a lot. I've been on the road for five months this year, and I never leave home without a list of things he's still looking for. Y you know, 30,000 records later, I'm still out there, you know, looking for things for him and looking for things for myself. But um, let's get back to where it started. Um, okay. You grew up in Toronto, right? Yeah, I actually grew up in Brampton, which is a suburb about 25 kilometers outside here. And uh, I realized uh, pretty young that I wanted to, uh, um, I wanted to be a DJ. I was a pretty shy kid, and it was a, a great way to. Uh, I felt it was a great way to not only you know share my love for music, but to, uh, uh, but to uh, actually also get into working, you know, working in the club world where there was so much excitement going on because uh, you know that's the middle of the 70s and, uh, you know, uh, everything was in its evolutionary state, almost the same way it is right now. Do, do you remember the first time you set foot in a club? Yes. Um, I, went to, uh, I went to a club in uh, Toronto, and I was 17 years old. The legal age was 21 at the time. I don't and uh, I, uh, I remember I went to the Kutubia Disco, which is at Eglinton and... Uh, Eglinton and uh, Mount Pleasant, which is just about 15 minutes drive from here, in a hotel, because at that time, hotel discos were th all the rage. And uh, I managed to sneak in, and I met the DJ at a, at a store, and uh, I went inside, and the first record I danced to was from East to West uh, by Voyage, and the girl I danced with ended up being the lead singer of Taps, which is a group I ended up developing 10 years later. And and Voyage was a French group, right? Yes, so uh, it was uh, produced by uh, um, a guy named Roger Tokars, who is a um, who is the preeminent uh, jingle uh, house producer in in probably most of Europe, and uh, he used some of the greatest session musicians in France, like Slim Pezin and Marc Chantereau and uh, uh, Pierre Alain Dahan. Sorry, just forgot. And um, they went on an incredible string of records. Um, uh, first, you know, doing from east to west with uh, the Sarone trio of uh, Sue Glover, Sonny Leslie, and Kay Garner doing vocals. And then they discovered a 19-year-old girl named uh, Sylvia Mason James from England who ended up singing on Souvenirs and Let's Fly Away and subsequently did a solo album with them on Carrere in France. 
And could you describe a bit the setting in a disco back then? I mean, you d you just mentioned that you were dancing with the girls, so people actually danced with each other back then? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was probably the worst hustle dancer in the history of modern mankind, which is probably one of the reasons I... Uh, um, I was drawn to the after hours clubs where you didn't have to dance with anybody. You just got on the floor and you, you know, you just, you got out there and you just uh, threw your hands in the air and went crazy. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a lot of people, you know, practicing moves that they saw on television. There was, uh, you know, disco television shows on NBC and CTV and, and, uh, you know, they would read magazines, for example. And, uh, you know, it, it was very glittery. You know, you'd have, um, you know, you'd have track lighting that would just basically blink on and off, and uh, it, it was wonderful and it was kitschy. And today it would be incredibly cheesy, but I think if we were all there uh, today, we would probably be up and, and dancing as well. And this was still pre John Travolta, right? Yeah, thank God. Um, you know, uh, Saturday Night Fever is uh, it was a blessing and a curse in many ways. I mean, I think it. Uh, Really, I it's funny, it, r it really doesn't tell the true story of it from everyone's perspective. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it the, the disco scene wasn't just one sector of people in those days. I mean, you had, uh, our disco composition was comprised of um, Italians, Greeks, um, uh, uh, people of color, um, you know, people who did everything but listen to rock and roll. And, you know, Lucy Martin of Chic, you know, um, we sang so many great records with them, was quoted once as saying that disco has no color. And if um, Toronto, having over 150 nationalities living in it, I it was absolutely true at that time. It didn't matter who you were or where you were from. If you got in, you owned the world. And I think that's what drew me to it. And how hard was it to get in then? You know, I... Um, it's funny. I, I, it was. Um, I guess it was. I guess it was uh, difficult in some ways, but uh, um, you know, uh, there's the running joke that in Los Angeles, if you put a, a velvet rope in front of a sewer, people will spend uh, you know twenty five twenty five dollars to walk over it. But I, I think in in back in those days, um, you know, it, it it wasn't super difficult until the boom really really hit. I mean, at that time, it was just a place to go and, you know, listen to uh, listen to music and go dancing and buy a couple drinks and hope you meet somebody. But um, I think the uh, getting into the clubs wasn't really that difficult until the clubs reached a certain level that, uh, you know, they they had a um, they made you wait and they picked and choose, you know. But the velvet rope thing was it really wasn't crazy in '76 or '77. And what were the great clubs in Toronto then? You mentioned hotel discos. Were there any different to a uh, normal, so to speak, disco? Or well, yeah, because I mean, back then, uh, you know, the clubs were open, were open from about 9 p.m. until 1 a.m. You know, Toronto has always had this medieval problem with uh, how long they were allowing people to drink. So um, they I extended it to two o'clock. Yeah, I know. I thought I, I thought about singing "It's a Miracle" or something. You know. Uh, but um, I think the, the truth is I, I didn't think I could express myself in, in, in those clubs, so I always went to the, I always drew myself to the after-hour clubs. I mean, you know, the big clubs in the day, um, the big disco bars were like uh, Hot Spurs, which was the first uh, club to have a live-to-air um, broadcast on a radio station, which was really huge here. It wasn't like Montreal, where it's been a tradition since the mid-'70s. Um, the Hippopotamus Club and uh, Rooney's. Um, actually, Rooney's was the, uh, the place that had the uh, live to air. Um, the Ports of Call, and uh, which is a place that I ended up working in, or just called the Ports, and they had Scandals, which was downstairs. So you kind of did your apprenticeship downstairs until you got to the big room upstairs. And, and there were a, a number of amazing, uh, you know, gay clubs that, that really started things like the Quest and the 511 and... Um, uh, steps and stages and stages was probably the granddaddy uh, of them all I in its peak and um, you know there are so many of them that are innumerable to mention but uh, you know that's that's a big part of uh, of that part of it and and you mentioned Montreal so were there uh, local differences between Toronto and Montreal and 
Oh, completely. Yeah. Uh, the, the Montreal DJs, in my opinion, are probably the greatest that ever played. Um, guys like Robert we met, and George Cucuzella from Unidisc was actually the first DJ at the Limelight. And you could almost say that George was probably one of the first real superstar DJs. The Limelight was a club in Montreal. Yes, yeah. it was. Mm -hmm. The Limelight and the 1234. And, um, you know, we uh, when the Toronto DJs could get a day off because it... You know, there wasn't any of this re residency stuff back then. Basically, you worked six nights a week, and if you missed a day, even if it was a Tuesday, you could come back and you might have been fired. So, um, you know, it's not about doing a seven-hour extended set like I'm seeing uh, um, one of the uh, da and Danny Howells or something coming over from England. I had to do that every night. And um, so the, uh, the guys in Montreal musically... They just had a, very co a real, I think the best word would be continentalism. They had a, a real je ne sais quoi about the way they played their music. And, and it was completely different. And their mixing style, you know, um, I always said that, the, uh, that a, uh, a bar DJ playing from nine to one in a place way out in the suburbs was probably three times better than the best DJ somewhere who was getting all the press in the U.S. or internationally. They just had incredible technique and they had a a wonderful flair for, for their music, and, and they, they drowned in it. They loved it, you know, in a way that I've never seen. N not even in New York? No. I think the great New York DJs are, you know, uh, the great New York DJs, um, the really great ones are, um, you know, you can, uh, you can probably name, and, and I just don't think it's all about one city. I think this was a, a party that everybody was invited to, and you know, having to live with, a, you know, especially in Canada where you've got a 900-pound gorilla with the America being so much bigger right next to you. Um, you know, we, we just had a different, we had a different uh, perspective of it. And we were feeding that market like crazy because uh, some of the music that came into Canada was never, uh, was very, very difficult to, uh, to get in the States unless they imported it from us. So how would you, how would you describe that different perspective then compared to... New York? Well, I think in, um, on a music point of view. On a music point of view. Um, I think that the um, American uh, uh, DJs, a lot of them in the beginning were, were, um, were playing a lot of records that were, you know, made in the USA. And to spice up their programs, they wanted to get, you know, different things like, you know, Sol Makosa by Manu Dibango in the early 70s was one of the, you know, first imports to come from France or Jungle Fever by the Chicacas. And this is goes back to 1971, 72, and 73. But we had, we had things that were causing uh, nightmares um, for record labels because, uh, you know, things like Crystal Grass and um, Le Sifflet du Baron, like, crazy obscure little singles and they would never be released in America because they could never get radio play. But in Canada we were much smaller so we, we ended up feeding them a lot of things from South Africa and from Italy and from France and, um, and actually and from Canada of course and uh, I think we, we uh, Canadians helped make it a, a global business because we weren't only feeding them international music they couldn't acquire, we were also feeding them uh, Canadian music that was helping change the landscape so that it, it didn't feel boring. And if they released our records or the international records and they picked them up, they'd also remix them because a big problem back then was the import. You know, if, the, if all the DJs are playing the import, you had to give them a reason to keep playing it. You know, so if, uh, like Moon Boots that we were just playing a little bit earlier when it came out as a 45 on Areola, everyone was playing the 45, but when Tom Moulton mixed it, being, you know, the greatest remixer of all time. Tom Moulton from New York. Yes. Right? Um, he's a person who just loved music so much, and, and what he ended up doing things is he ended up reinventing things. And I think that's what you had to do back then, because, you know, you couldn't be boring, because there was someone out there staring at you trying to take your job, if you're a DJ, that's for sure. But maybe we could have a listen to some of the Canadian stuff, right? Okay. I gotta figure out which one to pick. But you know, I, I'm gonna play a little piece of the first 12 inch single that I ever bought, um, which is called uh, um, Fighting, uh, Fighting on the Side of Love. And um, this, um, this record was actually one of the few that combined people in Toronto and people in Montreal working together. Uh, Ian uh, Gunther and Willie Morrison were two Toronto-based producers 
um, that uh, ended up producing Grand Tour, Sticky Fingers, uh, THP Orchestra. And this THP Orchestra record was actually the first one that they, they did. And uh, I sold a collection of baseball cards to become a DJ to afford to buy records. So this was the first 12 inch I bought. You know. uh, but uh, so th this is called uh, Fighting on the Side of Love and they're accompanied I think by Michelle Daig and Dominic Sicente of Montreal who ended up producing Alma Faye Brooks. It's funny when I listen back to this because, you know, I, uh, I also keep remembering how difficult it was to mix in and out of. Uh, but um, the, uh, the great thing about it is every, every music business has a, has a beginning. And um, he had a much bigger hit with a song called Something's Up as well. And, um, I mean, some of the records that uh, ended up uh, getting made by that production team are, are legendary. And they've been sampled over and over as well, too. So. Um, maybe in comparison to that, we could listen to something by by the Bombers. By the Bombers. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, that was your that was your beginning of the Toronto disco stuff. Now uh, Montreal, as I mentioned, and I've given a lot, paid a lot of homage to it so far. They um, they were definitely uh, ahead of us. And one of the things, of course, in the uh, um, in that period was the fact that a lot of songs ended up getting covered. And one of the biggest records at the uh, foundation of the disco movement was a, a song called The Mexican by Babe Ruth, which was a, a rock band that recorded for Harvest in the early 70s. And uh, the song ended up getting covered by Jelly Bean on his uh, EMI, Wodupski, uh, um EP that he ended up doing in the early 80s. But long before that, um, Pat Desario, who is one of the uh, architects of the Montreal disco scene, and George Lagios as well, a uh, great producer, ended up doing a, a, a cover version of The Mexican. And uh, this was mixed by Paul Polos, who is a DJ in, uh, in from the US. So uh, did you know that the original by Babe Ruth was also very influential for the, uh, as Mr. Mao maybe can uh, testify, w also very um, influential for what was happening in New York then with the first hip hop guys. It wouldn't surprise me. Hmm? It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, but this was nothing that you in, in Toronto or Montreal or so noticed when it began coming up in, in New York? You know, it's funny, when, uh, um, when, when we would hear that information sometimes, especially when it was something that was, uh, you know, a developing or evolving thing, y you know, the press would only really give it to us when it hit a certain mark. You know, I mean, uh, the Village Voice wasn't exactly the easiest thing to get back in the day. And, and, um, and Billboard or the major music magazines were really covering things that were selling rather than things that were developing. And it would probably have been something from a cultural point of view that the New York Times would have written a neighborhood story on rather than uh, us seeing it. I did want to mention one other thing before we moved on. Um, the um, Back in the day, there were a number of different kinds of clubs in the Toronto area. And a couple of the really interesting ones, like Arvive, was had a membership plan where um, I, I think I worked there on Mondays, even though it was dead, because I was basically just trying to own my, own my skills. And... Um, a lot of us started working in the A-level clubs on the nights where there was nobody there. And to me, the, the best DJ in the world is the one who will play with the same kind of passion and intensity on a dead night than they can on a night where the club is full. So, um, you know, whether I was working there or in heaven or one of the other, other big clubs, you know, I, I always remembered that. But, um, yeah, speaking of that, w when you have this night job that is actually a day job then because you have to do it every day right um how how do you keep yourself like motivated i mean like playing music every night the same records trying to change it or how did you do that well um i actually didn't really sleep much in those days so you know my my thing was uh i would dj from tuesday to sunday i would have mondays off um and i would work um 
five days a week at a record store, which was, let's say, from where these chairs are to, to us, uh, about maybe 150 square feet, uh, called Disco Sound of Canada, which was on the, uh, just north of Young, two blocks north of uh, College on Young Street. And uh, I got in there by accident. Um, I looked for the store forever. And uh, I went and I, I worked there from uh, 11 o'clock until um, 7 o'clock. And then I would go home. I would have what I called a disco nap from 7.30 until 9. I would eat something that was really bad for me. And then I would go to work at 11 uh, p.m. And I would play until... Four o'clock in the morning, uh, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday to uh, Thursday, and then on uh, Saturdays until everybody left, which is usually about seven, seven in the morning, and then uh, we'd all go to uh, France and have breakfast at between seven and nine o'clock, and then we would uh, go home, go to sleep, and I'd be up in three hours, and I'd be back at the store, and uh, it was a life that I would never trade for anything because we, um, you know. At any given time, anything could come in. And when the new records were coming in, our store was completely full. And I'm saying 25 A-level DJs trying to get 10 copies of the records, like the day that Disco Inferno came to Canada. And it was never anywhere. And uh, Tom uh, actually, Tom Moulton actually uh, put a, went down to Record Haven, which was a huge exporter in New York, and put one copy on it for Peter my, uh, Frost, my late colleague. And uh, we just stood there, and we, we didn't know what to do. You know, and that's, that happened every day. The first day that Santa Esmeralda came in, the first day that Patrick Jouvet invaded North America as an import from France, or the first, uh, the first day that uh, uh, Isaac Hayes' uh, disco connection was in the store which is a song you could resell to people all the time because they liked it so much they forgot they already bought it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the other thing about this store that was incredible is that anybody who was anybody was calling us from all over the world because we had what no one else could find and we would pick up our phone. So the mail order business was crazy, and it had a dog that was a mascot. And if you didn't give something to the dog, the dog actually remembered and snarled you out of the store. <laughs> so... Uh, it it, uh, it was really, uh, it, it was great to do that. And, and, you know, you were talking to people inside the music business, and there was this really, there was this cultural boom that was going on. You know, because you, uh, if you lived in, a, in uh, an all-white neighborhood, you met someone of color. If you'd never met anyone who was from a different country or something like that, or, or you'd never met someone from the United States or flew in from... Uh, Amsterdam or something like that, you met them. I mean, if you'd never met a gay person in your life, you were going to meet them there. It, it was this cultural whirlpool, and it, it's, uh, it was like the United Nations on, on a dance floor, only it was made of carpet. And the one thing that we always used to get yelled at was trying to mix between two records um, because we had the no Q headphone between two turntables in the store, so we auditioned and played the records for people. And... Um, you know, and we had Lenko L75 turntables, which did not have, they were motor driven, they weren't belt drives. So, you know, you're, you're, you, you have the actual cue and you're just nudging it along because, it, you know, th this thing was years away from coming. So uh, I, I remember buying an old Lenko L40 turntable and I said to my dad, I said, look, it's a collector's item. He goes, yeah, it's going to be collecting dust in six months. <laughs> and I don't think I ever used it. And... Um, do you remember the first day in your store when you heard something by Gino Socio? I, I've got the world's best Gino Socio story, actually. <laughs> yeah, then let's hear it. But, G <laughs> but you know, Gino was uh, Gino was one of those guys who just has. Um, um, he was a huge influence uh, on me, both personally and professionally. And the first time I met him uh, was at an Ontario disco pool meeting because. Uh, you know, the disco pools were a place where all the DJs were members of, and they all used to congregate, and we used to go there, and, and we would pay a membership fee, and we would get some of the jewels and gems that we're playing today. And, you know, Gino kind of took me under his wing, and I had never been to Montreal, and I said to him, well, you know, I'd really like to come to Montreal and, you know, see you work sometime. It'd be great. 
And he goes, well, okay, whenever you're in town, just give me a call. So naturally, I didn't call before I got there, and I just went to Montreal, knocked on his door, and said, hey, I'm here. And uh, <laughs> he just looked, and he kind of shook his head. He goes, like, who is this screwball from Toronto who's showing up on my doorstep? He couldn't have been nicer. He couldn't have been a better mentor. We went out that night to a private Montreal club with Geraldine Hunt, who wrote Can't Fake the Feeling. You know, she is from uh, St. Louis originally and uh, lived in, um, did some records for Roulette and moved to Montreal doing with touring bands. And, um, and uh, we, we partied our faces off, and I think I left at about 5 in the morning. And Gino and I had breakfast the next morning, and I was bitching about some record. And he looked at me and he said, well, what the hell have you ever done in your, in your career? And that was the day that my career started. And uh, to this do day... You, do you remember the record you were bitching about? It was either that or it was a promotion person. I mean, I mean you know, the, the great thing about being a DJ is you can complain about almost everything. Um, you know, you, you, it, it, was, it didn't have to be anything special. You know, you just had to... Uh, you complaining is part of the trade? Oh, yeah. Whining, bitching, complaining, getting upset about not getting something first. You know, uh, we, uh, we had one of my former roommates, uh, Gordon McMillan, who was a great, great DJ, played here at the Quest uh, um, as one of the preeminent gay clubs in the city. <laughs> he was the best. He, he would get a record in from one of the U.S. promotion people, he would automatically chart it at number three on his, or number two on his chart, and he would put it at, in the store where I worked. So everyone was complaining about him all the time because he was obviously posturing to say, well, I have it first. But he would play the hell out of the record. And, uh, and he would date stamp everything. He was very specific about the stuff. But, you know, it, it was things like that. I mean, I think I was complaining to Gino about not getting any... You know, not just not getting any respect for what I was doing. But, you know, the great thing is, is that when, when uh, Gino set me straight, he said, if you want to be a part of the business, you have to be pa uh, positively passionate. You just can't, you know, scream your head off and, and kind of like bitch about the world. Because the truth is, is that uh, um, we're all brothers and sisters. I'm still a DJ today, you know, 35 years after I played my first record. And he was trying to teach me that. And uh, it, it's a great lesson. And that's why, uh, uh, you know, no matter where I go, um, I really listen to the guy who's playing. And if I don't like the music, I won't. I'll, I'll bitch about it as I always used to and, and as people used to about me. But I think the great thing is, is that you learned an awful lot about yourself by discovering what other people do. And I think that's what Gino was trying to instill in me. And, and it worked. But before uh, we hear what Gino's comment led you to, maybe we hear a little bit of uh, Gino's stuff. No? Just to give people an idea. Yeah. This is actually a sin. You know, I, I actually have the 12 inch of uh, dancer in the wrong sleeve. That was like uh, you knew that someone was in your DJ booth when you worked five or six days a week because it's like, I didn't leave that there. That's not my thumbprint or anything like that. This is a dancer. And it, it's different to the um, THP record, right? We yeah, well, um, listened to first. I, I remember uh, when I visited Gino at that time, he had a, a, a box that was kind of like... I think it was uh, some kind of uh, prehistoric sequencer. And he was very much into, you know, uh, developing new sounds and, and doing a lot of experimentation. And, and uh, you know, he had, um, uh, you know, done a, a, a remarkable thing on The Visitors, you know, which was a song that was on a, uh, his S beat record. And, and um, you know, just r he really... Um, he he really continued to be a lot more on the electronic tip, where you know uh, Willie and Ian were doing a lot more orchestral orchestral based music, and you know it it just depended uh, depended on what your groove was, and I think um, I, you know dancer is kind of like a national anthem in many ways because anybody can dance to that record. I mean you know some of the disco stuff that is much more in the orchestral vein 
um, you know, you it, you would expect to dance a, a different way to it than you would to this. You know, you could just get on and move, and it didn't matter what size you were or, or you know, or where you were. And what kind of groove did you prefer? You know, uh, I, I was, you know, I, I was a, a, a huge snob. <laughs> And uh, the um, the orchestral stuff that was kind of mixed with something funky was big for me, or it was um, it was as big and as expansive and as orchestral, and it probably came from France or from Italy, because uh, you know I, um, uh, I I grew up on orchestral based pop, and this was just a natural extension to it. And if it was funky, like I'm the biggest Tom Bell fan in the world, who's my favorite producer on the soul side, as Giorgio Moroder is on the electronic, or Serona Costandinos is on the disco side. So for me, it was uh, the bigger it was, the more anthemic it was. And w if it commanded you to listen, I was all over it. And I would play the hell out of it. And I would go anywhere to find it. I would do exactly what some of you have done by hitting the vinyl stores, you know, this week and uh, experiencing something new. But for me, it, if it was European, the packaging was better, the mastering was better, it was a lot sexier to have. You wanted to have it and you wanted to piss off your fellow DJs by having it first and, and you wanted to bang it as hard as you could to make sure that they knew that you were there first. It was a real competition. Yeah, so I was just about to ask that the, the competition side of being a DJ. It was ruthless. It was absolutely ruthless. Um, um, I actually got my, uh, my, my big break going from the B clubs to the A clubs um, because I had uh, worked at Disco Sound, as I mentioned, and I was about to quit because I, I was going to get into the travel business. Uh, you know, and uh, so I left and I went, took a job in the suburbs. Wh what do you mean with travel business? I was going to basically get into the travel business. I was going to be a, I love to travel. I mean, I go around the world uh, once a year and uh, um, believe it or not, I was going to just, I was going to retire. I figured, well, I'm, you know, I'm 20 and maybe I, <laughs> maybe I'll do something different. And uh, I quit working at Disco Sound for about Uh, three days, went went home uh, to the Burbs and got a little bored, went to the music store. <laughs> so I said, can I have a job? This is my experience. They said, okay, you're hired. Within three days, they transferred me back downtown to one of the chain stores where I had to be selling meatloaf and, and uh, the Beatles and sticks and all these rock records along with people looking for the Commodores and for disco imports. So I basically went back to the store, begged to get my job back. And on the second day I was there, um, one of the, the owners, uh, there was a, a, a club chain called Momo's. They had a place right at Young and Bloor. And, uh, they, uh, and uh, the owner of the club had what most of us DJs would have considered the most gorgeous daughter you've ever seen in your life. Uh, blonde, ice blue eyes, the whole thing. Everybody was in love with her. So she came into the store to buy a record and she says, I'm having a birthday party and I want you to be with the DJ. And uh, two of my closest friends were, were working there. And I don't know what the hell I did because I don't remember. All I know, I was in a real DJ booth where you had to get steps to come and see me. And it was an institution in uh, Toronto And apparently, I just kicked it. <laughs> I, I was uh, apparently I was amazing that night, and uh, that night I uh, got held back by the owner, uh, Manny Moda, and he looked at me and he said, "I want you to be our DJ permanently here." And I said, "Well, I don't even know what kind of crowd he goes." And he goes, "I don't care." He said, "I said, are you sure?" He goes, "Yeah." So I said, "Okay." Little did I know that two of my best friends got <laughs> fired that night because I got their jobs. So, and believe me, what goes around certainly does come around in the city. And I used to visit those people when I was a junior, you know, learning, you know, just watching how they would play a crowd. Because, you know, you can't teach someone how to be a great DJ. And you can't teach someone how to be a mediocre DJ. It's either in your soul, it's in your heart, 
and, and you just, um, you learn to relate to the crowd. And, uh, you know, so basically, my roommate at the time had been recommending me to take over that job if they ever needed someone. They just said, you know, Vince is good. He seems to have all the imports. Nobody else can find them. We don't know how the hell he does it. You should hire him. And uh, I guess uh, the rest is history. I ended up staying there for four years. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, everyone was trying to get my job. I had one guy who would just literally go in the middle of my dance floor and stare at me for hours, like try to unnerve me, like uh, never took a vacation in, in four years until it was time to, li to leave. And like every other club, I mean, uh, the, the end came swiftly, but in 1984, on the very last night the club was open, one of my regulars, who became the focal point of the group Taps that I worked with on my Power Records label, he said, I want you to come back. He goes. Uh, he just started, you know, swearing his head off. He goes, I don't give up about anything. He goes, this is your club. Everyone else can go to hell. And he basically gave me the keys. And uh, I played the last night. And then the day after, they turned it into a restaurant. <laughs> or a deli or something. So you had, all, uh, but you had one DJ would go into a club. They'd be working the managers like crazy. Oh, I'll do this for you. I'll, I'll make tapes for you. Or they, they would, you know, they would go in and they would practice all their mixes. And then they would put a tape in the guy's pocket goes, I'm better than the guy you got. He sucks. And uh, I'll tell you something else. The female DJs in this town, there was um, four or five of them were unbelievable. And the ladies had to work twice as hard. And they made us look real bad because they were damn good. And um, you were just speaking of relating to the crowd. So uh, how did you balance the whole DJ ego thing that goes on about, oh, I have all the best music in the world versus uh, what the people actually want to hear or want to dance to? Well, there's two things. I, I was, I'm a Leo, so my ego is completely out of control. You know. <laughs> so there's no hope there. But the bottom line is I had one rule when I played for a crowd. I played for the ladies. I played for the women. I couldn't, I, I couldn't care about the guys. The guys were coming anyway. And my job was to get the women on the floor and to keep them happy and at all costs. And I didn't, you know, um, the, the, reason that, the reason that I say that is because the pulse of a club in those days was based on how intense your party was and how your, your crowd related to, uh, uh, you know, how your crowd related to what you did. If you can't draw the first six to ten women, you know, like, the women always came early. The guys never came early. You know, remember, I, I didn't start working at this P Club until 11. The first hour was mine. 12 o'clock, you have a couple of people who wanted to get in because we only had 32 seats in the club. You could only get 500 people in it or 400 people in it. And then we had like, like these things. Like if you can imagine these, uh, these uh, seats here, well imagine having them stacked like steps. That's, that's what we had. And um, you could only get so many places to sit down and then you were done. You know, you, you, you were basically up all night. So my thing was, you know, who do we have coming in tonight? And, and, if, uh, and it w if it was 50-50 uh, female to male, the boys would love me. And they would keep that floor going because they would keep dragging the girls back on the floor all night long. And that was my job. My job was to treat the female p um, patrons like royalty so the guys would be happy because if the happier they were, the longer they'd stay. And, you know, that's the, um, it's a strange philosophy. You know, people go, well, you know, I went and I EQ'd my sound and I readjusted the lights. It's like, hey, I had, a, I had the best sound, sound man and the best light guy in the world. He just, all he wanted to do was lights. He didn't want to be a DJ. I mean, that's another thing that, you know, uh, the great light man who always somehow wanted to be the DJ. And we had, to, we had to be aware of this all the time, you know? I mean, one of the greatest light men who ended up being a musician was Patrick Cowley, you know, who started out being a light man in San Francisco and, and uh, uh, w you know, worked those clubs and was a synthesizer keyboard player. So he kind of enveloped the, the both things without ever becoming a DJ. But did a lot of records, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the I Feel Love bootleg, which we bought in New York for 40 bucks. 
um, on an acetate that you could only play like 25 times. And so what is an acetate? Maybe for oh. people that don't know. Well, before a record becomes a record, <laughs> it, goes to, it used to go through three stages. Once the mix was done, they would go to this place in New York called uh, uh, Sunshine Sound, which was at 1650 Broadway, one of the most famous record industry addresses in the world. And they would go in and they would get, I guess, a, I, I guess in the, some worlds they call them dub plates, where you could get a 10-inch or a 12-inch um, uh, cut, and you could basically play it 30 or 40 times. And so you would go from an acetate, like let's say you, you know, you're working in, uh, you're working in a, a club in New York, okay? Like so. And you know, this is, this is your card from my late friend Richie Kazor from Studio 54. And you know, he, he so, and you're the promotion guy. So you get this thing called an acetate. And you go in to the club and go, hey, how you doing? You know, I got a new record for you. Do you want to play it? And of course you would, because you don't want to lose the luxury of playing something that hasn't even been manufactured yet. And as soon as the mix is approved and they see the reactions, and the next thing that they do is they, uh, they do a test pressing, which is like a, a white label, and it just has the name of the, uh, the record on it. And then when it's good to go and those mixes are approved, then they manufacture it. So the acetate is kind of like the first generation of the piece of vinyl. Thank you. Cool. Um, but uh, you were talking about Patrick Cowley right. until I... Uh, interrupted you? Um, you know, Patrick was uh, someone who really who left us way too soon. And um, I was working for, um, um, I was not only the first writer, in, um, the youngest writer writing for disco music or dance music in the history of the country. I was 17 years old. I was also the first promoter um, working for an American promotion company in a foreign territory in the disco business. And I worked for a company called 120 Dance Promotion. And um, T.Q. Fanshaw, um, who was a, uh, a club impresario uh, based in uh, San Francisco, he uh, hired me because I was always trading imports with his key DJs. And uh, he said, we've got this record on the Fusion label that you've got to hear called and I go, what's it called? And I said, I th he said, I think they're going to call it Menergy. I said, okay. And he goes, uh, yeah, so I guess this must be, uh, he goes, it's kind of like Giorgio, but it's cool. I go, what does that mean, Giorgio's God? And he said, yeah, but it's really different. You know, it's very trippy. And um, that was at a very crucial time. We were talking 1981, where everything was changing because M came out with pop music and the B-52s with Rock Lobster, so it really was changing the, the disco landscape a lot. And, you know, I remember working at Latube and getting the first, I got five copies of it, which I gave to my two roommates and to the other, you know, key DJs in the territory. You know, you really spoiled your friends. I remember putting this thing on for the first time and, and the place just went into orbit. And, um, you know, Patrick had a consistent uh, way of doing this. And, um, you know, he, he had one club goer kept bugging him to do a record when he was doing Lights, and it turned into Right on Target by Paul Parker, um, which has been used as the basis rhythmically for a weekend by Dead Eye Dick, uh, DJ Dick in Germany. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it Patrick was just one of those guys who he really reinvented the wheel uh, electronically because he was using... Um, he was using technology and, and tape loops and all kinds of really different things. And he was also mixing at a huge studio. You know, like he was do working at the Automat. And then, you know, he got together with Sylvester and ended up doing Do You Want a Funk, which was done for $802 and has made about $20 million in revenue. It was one of the greatest records ever made. And Sylvester and was who? Sylvester was um, uh, someone who came out of the San Francisco uh, drag scene. Uh, he had done uh, records uh, for the Blue Note label and uh, uh, on the West Coast. And, uh, and then he uh, signed with Fantasy Records. And uh, yeah, he was working with Harvey Fuqua, who had worked on the, uh, um, who had worked uh, in Motown uh, and, you know, had produced the Jackson 5 and everything. And, uh, you know, Gladys Knight, the great legendary R&B singer, 
uh, was once told by her mother that if you really want to hear someone sing falsetto with soul, she goes, enough of that garbage, listen to Sylvester. Uh, I, I've seen it, I saw him live three times, the best three shows I ever saw. And um, he was this towering six foot three androgynous male who was the precursor to every uh, flamboyant, exotic, insane performer. And, you know, just sang like a bird. And, and Patrick uh, did a lot of records with him, played synthesizers on a lot of his stuff. And um, Patrick's partner, um, Marty Blackman, uh, was part of a team called he um, Blackman Hedges Promotions in San Francisco. And they remixed all of those Sylvester records with the exception of You Make Me Feel Mighty Real. So, you know, Sylvester is a benchmark. Anyone who sings falsetto, uh, you know, you answer, <laughs> you answer to Sylvester, basically, in that era. Um, do we have something by Sylvester? Yeah, I'm going to do something I never thought I would ever do, but you know what? <laughs> Where is it here? It's still sealed. <laughs> You know, there's a great story about uh, when Sylvester came to do a show in Toronto, the two tons of fun were with him. Uh, Isora Armstead and uh, Martha Wash. And one of the DJs, legendary DJs, Don Bell, kept trying to sell them diet powder uh, in the <laughs> after the show. But so maybe um, if someone doesn't know the two tons of fun, uh, were his background singers. And, and why did they need to diet? They were huge. <laughs> and they ended up becoming the Weather Girls. And uh, there was actually a third ton, which is Jeannie Tracy. Well, that's what he called her, and I, I, I wouldn't say. I got I don't know if this is... See, this is the other thing, too. Is, you know, when we got these records, we never knew if what speed they were, because half the time we didn't write anything. They didn't write anything on them. The other thing about this record that, that I remember distinctly is how many perfect mixtapes it ruined. Because uh, some, of the, uh, some of the edits in the later part of the song were uh, uh, just used to drive us crazy because you used to have to try and time them to get out. I mean, it wasn't nothing, you know, not this is a live drummer playing and a great live drummer too. And, and some of the um, uh, musicianship and the edits of what we had to do to construct a 12 inch single was was uh, com completely different, but uh, I don't think anyone, uh, that having been said, we would play Sylvester to death. I mean, he just, he was a real, he was a non-radio voice, you know, and he was, he was purely a disc, uh, purely a disco artist for the most part, and, and you know. It, it but uh, Bronski Pete made that into a radio record later on, right? Yeah. You know, uh, Bronski Beat also used one of the uh, breaks of one of my songs and put it in Small Town Boy, and it's, you know, match beat, beat for beat, so <laughs> it's, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it's... So it's a touchy subject. No, <laughs> no, not at all. I, you know what? I, I just don't think anything can beat this. I mean, I think Jimmy Somerville's a great artist, and I even, you know, tried writing stuff for him when he was signed to, uh, to uh, Sony BMG in Germany, but, um, you know, the Sylvester... Sylvester is an incomparable artist, and I think he was one of those artists from the era that you can go back and listen to. There is no auto-tune, and there's no patching, and, you know, he, he just, when he says you make me feel mighty real, it might be because he absolutely was. You know, he, he lived out his dream, and, uh, and he, was a, he was a great artist. And you just mentioned it a little bit. Recording back then was a different game than <laughs> today, right? Oh, God. Well, you know, I, I was laughing because I was, uh, you know, just hanging out and obviously getting to know some of the participants. And I was, I was uh, with Philippe in his room kind of constructing a, you know, we're, you know, just jamming basically and putting some ideas together. And I, I realized that um, all he had to do was double click and GarageBand opened. And for me, when I started, that would have taken six and a half hours. You know, we were on Atari, uh, even before the Atari 1040 ST came in. I mean, the first disco record I ever did was a record called Hardquake in 1981, which I'll post, uh, you know, on the Academy website. And 
and basically the the drum was uh, a, a dr like an old old rolling drum machine and, and basically it just went doom dump doom dump da dump doom that and we timed it one measure and then we uh, we repeated it we cut it twice and that was the loop of the whole so the drums <laughs> the drums didn't change because you know it, we were only working on a, an eight track uh, on an eight track board and uh, you know we had the drums, the bass, and everything was played live, including the percussion. And the record never saw the light of day. It's a real masterpiece. Uh, and uh, we ended up doing uh, electronic stuff, and it was, um, uh, we had uh, the old Atari 1040 ST, and uh, you know, we, uh, we started with two megabytes, and then we all had emotional overload when we were able to upgrade our, our, our system to four megs. Amazing. and. Uh, you know, we had to record each MIDI track one at a time, and that's if the that's if the sync man or the um, the Roland SPX box is actually kept in time. Uh, I, I actually want to buy a Roland SPX uh, just so I can get a chainsaw and cut one in half, so I can kill some of my <laughs> earlier problems. But making records back in those days was really difficult, and it was very difficult making them here, because. You know, Canadians, I mean, we live in a real folklore rock country. I mean, a lot of the Montrealers would go down and they would, you know, they would mix their records in Philadelphia with great legendary engineers like Gene Leone and, and, uh, and Joe Tarsia at uh, Sigma Sound. And, or they would make a record just good enough so that somebody in the U.S. would want to pick it up and remix it. And um, bless you. And uh, <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the funny, the funny thing about it is the uh, um, the recording techniques. They would mix our records like they were rock records, so things couldn't cut through, and um, that was a really huge problem. And the other thing too is once you made what you thought was a great record, the mastering engineers here needed an education as well because they were cutting, you know, they were cutting the THP Orchestra or Franz Jolie's records the same way they would cut a children's record or a country record. They were cutting it for sonic, sonic fidelity. They weren't cutting it to be played in a club. They just didn't, they didn't have the knowledge. So a lot, of the, um, early, uh, a lot of the early Canadian pressings of records were nightmares for Canadian DJs because they just couldn't play them. So you had to have them mastered in New York? Either that or we'd wait until the record got picked up in the States or in France or in Germany and we'd get the import and we'd play it because you have to understand, I mean, uh, the mixers that we used to use, I mean, I, um, it were uh, Reigns or, or, you know, the Serwin Vega mixers of the past, which were great because they had a big booming, uh, uh, they were great actually until someone poured a Coca-Cola into them, which has happened before. And... Uh, you know, they would amplify the sound, but you know, you would, I remember having these two old Yamaha amplifiers and these things were like, uh, you know, they were like tanks, you know? So if I had to play a Canadian record, I would go over to one of the amps and I would split it and, and just crank one side of it up so I wouldn't lose my dance floor mixing into it because the, the mastering engineers caused nightmares for us. But in the, in the end, um, you know, you're going to get a, a handout, and uh, a big part of uh, that is an article that was written on me in 1980 in Billboard where I complained about it. It almost got blacklisted by the Canadian music business. So, um, you know, I was never afraid to speak my mind, and I think that uh, we actually educated the mastering engineers. I mean, when I started my label, I, I would never let them master a record on their own. I attended everything, even if I didn't know what I was doing. I sure as hell was trying to learn <laughs> at the same time and teach them as well. And I would also bring other records that had been mastered or mixed and, you know, to educate the engineers. So you had a label of your own as well? Yeah, I, I've had uh, quite a few. Uh, um, I started a record label in 1982 called Power Records. And um, it was basically, uh, um, I, uh, I started it because I was working as a promotion man for Unidisc. And um, maybe, you, maybe you could talk a little bit about Unidisc first, right? The importance of this Canadian label. Sure. Um, uh, Unidisc uh, Productions in Montreal was a company originally called Downstairs Records. They had a record store on Saint Laurent Boulevard in Montreal. And what they did was uh, all the DJs went there the same way they went to Disco Sound of Canada. 
But what they did was they took it one step further. They decided to start a record label. And um, I might be wrong in quoting who they were, but I believe that Pat Desario was very involved, George Cucuzella, and uh, Dominique Zarka. And uh, they, you know, one was a business guy, one was the best DJ, and the other one was a great producer. So it was a great combination, plus they had this store. So um, eventually uh, Dominique moved on, became my partner in Power Records eventually. Uh, Pat was a great producer. Um, we worked with Quebec Electric and a bunch of other uh, uh, big uh, records like Eclipse. And uh, George actually stayed with the name and he changed the company's name from Downstairs to Unidisc, which was the record label. And um, we'd known each other for years and he decided to hire me as a promotion guy. And the first time I went to Montreal, I went to, uh, I saw all the gold records on his wall and I said, you know what, I think I'm going to start a label. So they gave me a distribution agreement that I hated. And George actually didn't find this out until about two years ago because his brother-in-law actually fired me when I wouldn't sign the distribution agreement, so I was in the record business. And the first A&R decision I ever made sold 180 copies. So that um, was actually an English record by a group called Hello. Um, and uh, it said goodbye really quickly, which is unfortunate. Great band. They actually had records out on Arista as well. And uh, I decided that the, w the three things that I wanted more than anything was um, something that had a lot of energy, a lot of drive, and a lot of guts. And power came out of that name. So, uh, you know, I basically uh, decided to start a record label on $250, a uh, check from my club for working five nights, which proceeded to bounce. Uh, which means that I had to go and collect the cash to cover the first mastering I did. And the first record I released sold 380 copies. And uh, the second record that I released sold 4,000, and the third one sold 4 million. 4 million. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's, um, there's two... Um, uh, there is two... Uh, uh, there's d it's, a, it's a really bizarre story, actually. It was three kids um, from the Portuguese neighborhood that were real club kids, and they uh, decided to um, they decided to uh, come and uh, to the club, and they were regulars. And uh, one of the guys said, uh, "You know, we're making a record." And I said, "Okay, well, uh, you know." And I was at that point, you know, their favorite DJ, so they always came to see me. So I said, well, I'm thinking of starting a record company. So uh, I released the first two records. The uh, first record was a, a song by a, a group called Ambience that went nowhere. And the second was actually um, a repressing of Souvenirs by Voyage. Um, and the, the funny thing is that this record ended up going through a whole bunch of changes. And um, it also um, was the first time I ended up writing as well. Um, they had this concept which was a little bit out there, and uh, I took... Uh, how, how would you explain writing? Okay, sorry about that. Um, what um, Garrett has not mentioned is I've been a songwriter for 25 years now. Sorry for that. No, 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 it's okay. I've been too busy talking and interrupting you the whole time. Um, but I've been a songwriter and um, for, uh, for years, and this was my second foray. This is basically the second song that I wrote, and I rewrote a lyrical concept that turned into a song called My Forbidden Lover. And I was basically the, the lyricist, because I had um, I'd actually been threatened with a suspension when I was 11 years old in school, because uh, we had a poetry contest when I was in sixth grade, and that's when I knew that I uh, had a talent to write. So uh, I, the teacher forgave me and uh, uh, and forgave himself for accusing me of it. And uh, I uh, ended up dreaming of being a writer ever since that day. So I, uh, I finally got to put it to use with these two club regulars and um, way too many people involved. <laughs> and, uh, and a singer who answered an ad in a record store on Young Street and got paid $100. And uh, she sang the hell out of the song, and uh, and th then the record exploded. And you know what happens after that, right? A young label. Not yet. 
a young label, a lot of kids, a lot of people who are really at the beginning of their careers. And then everyone starts suing everybody. <laughs> you know, it was just crazy. But the record took off like a rocket. It was number one for 10 weeks here. And, um, you know, TAP still does shows in California 20 years, 25 years later. And uh, actually, uh, Alan Coelho, who's the principal guy, is making a new record right now. And, and how much time had you, s had you then in the court? Well, he never really got to court. And it, it basically, an eight, uh, a record that got made for just under $1,000, I, I decided that it was a part of my blood. So once my label got more successful, I just bought the entire catalog from the producer who was you know, a very, very clever guy and uh, was a little bit more street savvy than us. I still own the, I still own the, the publishing. I still own the master. And it's in... Actually, uh, it can never, ever be sold. It's actually something that I've got with my lawyer that I will never, ever sell it because it's, uh, it, it is the most important record I'll ever, ma I'll ever be a part of. And I should tell you one other thing. During the making of this record, I got a phone call from my partner at the time because there was three of us that invested into the original record. And he said, you better come down here. And I said, why? He goes, because the producer's trying to make this vocal masterpiece into an instrumental, and he's right about to print the mix. I don't think I ever was in a taxi that fast in my life, and basically had to just settle everybody down. But the record came out, and, and it, it led to a great uh, tenure for the label. And um, you just have mentioned publishing. That's a field where you have some experience as well, right? Yeah, I, I'm actually a music publisher today. So, um, you know, you could say... Um, so what is what is publishing exactly? <laughs> okay. I never understood this. Well, let, let's say that the next the next uh, you know um, what can we say the next Gino Socio and Patrick Cowley are these two guys right here. Jack Cowley is the name of their band, right? So uh, we're at, they come to me and they say we've got this record. Well, what a publisher does is he he protects he protects the rights of the writers by by uh, working with the writers to develop their talent to go out and get them to work and produce with other uh, other artists to collaborate with other artists and to make sure that the the royalties generated by um, the manufacture or now the digital sale of a piece of music is paid to the publisher who shares it with um, the writers does that make any sense I at see. all basically we're very sexy accountants um, we take care of the things. We do the business side where the, uh, the, um, uh, the creative people want to be creative. Then what we do is we do the administration side. Once you're finished, we make sure your songs get registered. You know, we make sure that if there's an opportunity for you to work with other people that we call them and say, I've got these two unbelievable writers. You know, they're going to make you a star. You know, so I'm going to put, can we get, can I get you together with, uh, with my writers? And you, you know, that's, uh, and, and that is how the meeting of the minds comes where you have, you know, people who are uh, writing with one another, you know, how they, how they exist. You know, a lot of people like, you know, Disco Inferno was probably uh, two guys in a room, you know, writing together and it's sold 75 million copies. You know, and, and a publisher would take care of those rights. If somebody wants your song for a big movie, well, they would contact your publisher. And your publisher would then contact you and say, you know, they're doing, they're doing Saturday Night Fever 3. They want your song to be the theme song. They're going to pay us X amount of dollars. And they'll pay for using the master rights, and they'll pay for using what's called the synchronization right, which is to put your music in the film. they got to pay you twice, once for the movies, I mean, once to use the audio recording and once uh, to the publisher to take care of the uh, synchronization of it or to lock it together. Publishing is a very, very important business for you aspiring young writer and producers. It's the real estate of the music business. And it's extremely important for, for you to know that everything you do has equity. Never sign 100% of your publishing away. I know where every one of my songs is. From the first one I wrote, to the four that got requested by a Japanese label this morning. I know where every one of them is. 
and it's extremely important to me because it's you, it's your creativity, and you can never lose sight of that. A lot of people have, and they've gone on to regret it. And you're also at the forefront of a, of a real evolving music world right now. So whether it's disco or anything else, you've know, you got to take care of your publishing. Always get your publishing right. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And um, now I've been asking questions all the time, but maybe, yeah, some of you have questions as well. Check. Check. Okay. Uh, we were just talking about publishing, and as a composer, I've always wondered what the difference is between keeping my own publishing and just signing my stuff up with SoCan or ASCAP or BMI or whatever, and then the difference between doing that and then signing it over to, to you or another publishing company. Well, if I like it, I'd be really happy to hear that. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously you should register your songs with the Performance Society, whether or not you're with CI in Italy or SASEM in France or SoCan or ASCAP or BMI. Um, to register the song so that you can control the copyright and the ownership of the copyright. If someone can do something for you as a composer and as a writer, no matter what kind of music you're making, you know, then you should have a discussion with them. And if you think it's good for you, then uh, that's uh, that would be uh, part of your journey. I also think that if you're a creative person, whether you or not you're you're producing tracks or you're doing uh, any kind of music, you. Uh, you know, you can collaborate with someone who can do something that you can't. You know, so that's, that's why I went to, I've had so many mentors, and, you know, that's why mentoring um, many of you after this is over is extremely important to me. Do we have to pay someone to ask a question? Is there any book on the Canadian disco scene? You, you know about it? Uh, I've been trying to write one for a long time, <laughs> but uh, there isn't a book. But I think information-wise, um, you know, I'll give you my card, and if there's anything specific or there's someone you're trying to reach, I mean, it's pretty easy. I mean, we're a real close, tight-knit community of people back then. Um, you know, there's also been some great journalists here who have had a long history that I can put you in touch with, who have who have covered things, who would probably remember things that I, uh, I, I forget myself. But, you know, no book has ever been written on it because, you know, it, there's been some great books, like, there's been some really interesting books, but I, I'm such a purist that I, I tend not to read them. I read, I read the first um, 100 pages of a book from the UK called Saturday Night Forever, and there were so many, uh, uh, so many errors in it, I just, I threw it in the garbage. You know, if you were there, you, you know, the trivia is part of your lifeblood, so it's, it's kind of hard. I think we, we, the disco uh, craze or the disco, uh, the events that happened during the, the disco era were so much so, um, it was so, it's such a whirlwind and such a crazy time that I don't think everybody remembers everything. You know, so you almost have how to... How can that be? Well, you know, because, uh, you, well, obviously a lot of people are no longer with us, and that, that's a huge part of it. And, and, you know, it's funny, in the disco world, uh, people have different... Uh, a lot of people have different um, concepts of what they saw and seeing it there through their eyes. You know, like um, somebody in New York will say could say that they played... Uh, a Gino Socio record nine months before anyone in Canada did, and that could be true, but it would be so hard to prove. Or, you know, or, you know, when I got asked by somebody this week about, uh, you know, is Carol Gianni singing the original Get On Up and Do It Again by Susie Q, and the answer is yes. You know, and, and a lot of people would go, no, it isn't. It's this other girl from Montreal, and her name is this, and it's on the record. It's like, yeah, well, it's been re-recorded, but the original was by Carol Gianni. But it at the same time, this is what makes the whole thing so wonderful, right? Yeah. That there's not one truth, but many different sides of Yeah, of I mean, it. And it, keeps it, it keeps it really interesting for all of us, too, you know? And, and for me, um, when, when you talk about records that, you know, some records went to number one, and, s and, uh, and some records went to number ten, and... You know, records like this one, for example, which is George McRae working with Greg Diamond, who did Bionic Boogie, and who, who was...
is to me uh, one of the one of the greatest of the disco producers from America. You know, it, it's what keeps you. It, it's what keeps you looking for the facts that you know you've got ten different versions of the same story. But I'm just going to put this on for a minute. <laughs> The great thing about about you know disco music itself is that it it didn't have to be the biggest record it didn't have to be a number one it just had to connect with you and then you would start talking about it and you could you know start you know getting people very involved in what you loved as well and how did you feel about the downfall of disco music then or the quote unquote downfall um, after all the the big hype you know and then all of a sudden. Well, in a way, it was really, it was bittersweet. I mean, the media built it up and the media tore it down. But the truth is, is that when, when, when disco became a very, very dirty word and we changed from disco to dance and uh, whatever. It's changed everything. It's then. still disco to me. It doesn't matter if it was made last week or 1973 because it's, you know, the uh, disco at this point is the grandfather to all these kids. And uh, I, I think um, I, I was really happy when the media got out of it. Because um, Saturday Night Fever was really, uh, it was a media creation. It was a great movie, and it gave John Travolta a terrific career. But, you know, the, the, the Bee Gees songs were never written for the movie. They were written for another album. And 99% of the record was pretty much glued together to make a great soundtrack. You know, it's a great music supervision job, where, where, whereas Thank God It's Friday, um, which was the movie that Casablanca made that spawned Last Dance and Disco Queen uh, by Paul Jabara, um, is actually a far truer uh, show of, um, it's a far truer representation of what disco was than by going to Brooklyn where the crowd was all, you know, one, uh, one ethnic composition. You know, so we were happy when it went away because, um, when 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 disco was late was killed by the media um the truth of the matter is is that um th they killed it but they couldn't put us six feet under and we had a lot of people just fighting saying you know what this business is a lot stronger than a media who's basically going to cover a cooking show five minutes after they cover uh um uh, a club closing and the truth is, is they accented on the negative so much, we were kind of glad to get rid of them. And, uh, and, and the great thing is that suddenly you had this very beautiful, burgeoning, underground scene, just like you've got now, where, you know, energy, uh, you know, you could say that dance music or high energy music or, or funk or, what, or, or like the electronic funk music that came in the early 80s, well, that was just another, that's just another baby being born. It was just a, it was a new evolution for a business and for a, a, a medium that had a heartbeat long before they tried to kill it and had a, and, and, uh, and had a bigger one uh, when uh, the industry peaked in their eyes. You know, I mean, there were disco specials and disco television shows, and um, I, uh, I remember uh, distinctly that... Uh, a lot of what the clubs were doing didn't really change. I think the clothing changed a lot. You know, like what you see me wearing, this is what I wore to work. I once got fired for not wearing shoes in my DJ booth when I was working in a hotel club. My feet hurt. You stand in those shoes for seven hours, they'll kill your back, they'll kill your feet, you know? So I took them off and they fired me. That's the shit I wanted to get away from. I just wanted to go where the people would come in. They knew exactly what they wanted, and that what they wanted more than anything is they wanted to just hang out with me, dance their, dance their faces off until they couldn't stand up anymore. And that's really what happened after disco died. Because the thing is, it never really died. It just went to sleep. Because the truth is, is the, the raw roots and elements of, of that era, the entire music in the 70s has come back a zillion times. And it's going to come back again 25, 35 years after I'm gone because I I it's too powerful. It's just too strong. Even when we went out last night, you know, I heard the same thing. A and, it, and it was remarkable for me. And the music is enduring because you might not love all of it, but you sure will love a lot of it. And people always want to dance, huh? 
Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, when we went out last night and I heard you play. Uh, I, I would walk a thousand kilometers to hear you play. You were great because that room was empty. There was 20 people in it, in and out, and you never lost your focus. And you could have played in any era. You were great. I really enjoyed myself. And I was talking to a couple of the other, other old, uh, guys, and please never say the word old school in front of me. I'll go crazy. A lot of us veteran DJ types. <laughs> uh, we, we just sat there and went, she is great. And he, one of the guys looked at me and he goes, I hope she plays Dawn Ray next. And bang, it came on. That's a generational instinct. That's what I'm talking about. It's a, it doesn't matter where you're from. If the music moves you, then, uh, then it'll always move you. Oh, sure. <laughs> There are uh, a lot of re-edits coming out uh -huh. uh, yeah, in the last years. Um, I suppose they're uh, illegal in a way. Ha I mean, how yeah. this whole thing works, I'd like to know. Um, what can you make out of um, old tracks without having actually legal problems? So how are re-edits created? Well, basically, um, when you go into your... Um, when you go into your mix room or your studio or whatever you're going to do and you do a re-edit, um, the best thing to do is to contact the record company. And if you don't know how to get to them, well, you'll have my card and I'll get them in touch with you. Um, you know, the truth is if you want to, if you can do things, uh, if you have a gift to do things and you have the, uh, uh, you have the um, wherewithal, I guess, to do them legally, <laughs> You know, then it could turn into a career for you. It could turn into a mix album for you. I mean, and the truth is, is that your inventiveness or your creativity is different. You would do an edit that's different than he would or that I would or that they would or anyone else in this room. And the number one thing is to kind of get it heard. So if you, uh, the best thing to do would be to contact the record company or the, the license owners. And, and you know what, if they won't talk to you, you have to seek out somebody who will um, make sure that they talk to you. Yeah, but I think that most of the stuff that is coming out is like um, bootlegged, uh, well, boot actually. Well, <laughs> Not, I mean, you know. Well, bootlegs have been part of, you know, bootlegs have been part of uh, the, um, uh, have been part of the dance history and the disco history for years. And a lot of it is because of a creative invention one of the best bootlegs ever made was a song called Let's Do It in the 80s that turned into Stars on 45. I mean, that was a bootleg by three Montreal DJs. Um, and, you know, another one is the Get On The Funk Train remix, which we believe that Robert we met was involved in. And I have a 10-inch acetate of it. And it's absolutely amazing. And there's one of Freedom To Express Yourself by Denise LaSalle that uh, any of you guys or ladies who are playing 70s disco, you've got to get your hands on this if you can find it. And it's, it's unbelievable. It's always been part of the culture. I mean, even Patrick Cowley's I Feel Love was a bootleg. Um, I think that um, it just depends on what side of the business you want to be on. <laughs> you know, because uh, a lot of the music gets pirated because people can't get it. And, um, you know, uh, I don't want to see another... I, I'm not interested in seeing Sheik's greatest hits with the same 11 songs on it again. You know, I w it makes me want to shave my head. I, I want to see something where if, if there's a remix and someone actually believes that they can make the song better because, you know, we, we have to get the name value thing out of the re-edits and, and, uh, and put the artist back into the picture. And I think if your edits are creative enough, people are going to want to hear them. And if... Um, and the other thing, too, is that, you know, a lot of people manufacture these things on, them on their own because they just don't feel that there's, there's any, any other way to get them heard. I, I think we're at the forefront of a business that's really changing going into the digital age. And, and personally, I'm amazed at the love for vinyl here. It's, it's really been a revelation for me. Um, but I just say, find a way. There are people who manufacture vinyl. Maybe they have rights with a record company, and they could get your edit reissued. See, one of the other things that's a problem as well, for example, is that, um, let's say, uh, Denise, uh, I'm sorry, Dionne Warwick's track of the Cat record was produced by Tom Bell, one of my all-time ten favorite albums. 
There's a, I have a seven inch 33 RPM, seven minute version of a classic song called Once You Hit the Road. And I begged them to put this on, I begged them to put this on the, uh, on the CD reissue. And they couldn't because they needed to get the artist's permission to do it. And that could take hundreds of thousands of dollars of trying to get in touch with the, uh, the lawyers and, and, and the accountants and the estate if the person's no longer with us. But I'm saying, you know what? If you, um, you'll get my card. If you really want to do this, you send me the edit. And if I like it, I'll fight for it to get it released. Because that's what, because Gino did this for me. You know, everybody, so many people did this for me in the business. It, 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 if you want to get there, then I'll, I'm going to help you get there. It's that simple. Next question. Ah, yeah, we, we haven't heard anything uh, on Power Records. Okay. I'm going to play the follow-up to My Forbidden Lover, actually, a song called Burning With Fire. And uh, this, um, in its day, um, was actually considered extremely progressive. Um, they used a lot of Roland micro composers, which I know some of you guys have 303s and 606s and 808s and 909s and everything. And... Uh, I, um, I originally wrote this lyric uh, for the song, and it was originally called Call Me, and then the uh, producer uh, got into an argument with me, and they rewrote, they basically took parts of what I wrote, and it ended up being Burning With Fire, which was number two record in Mexico, number one record in Holland, number one record here, and number one in the U.S. You know, it's funny listening to that, and it's it's been a long time, but... Uh, um, it sounds like it could have been made in Italy, right? Yeah, well, you know, the f th that's the funny thing about uh, the more, uh, the more uh, you know, arpeggiated some of the synths would be, they would say, oh, well, you know, they would classify it as the tallow disco, or, but, um, you know, Alan Coelho, who's the brainchild of taps, and is a great musician, and he was... Uh, he was obsessed with Patrick Cowley, and he was a huge fan of, of um, the, the more electronic the record was. He was just in there, and, and um, he was always bothering me for tapes, and, and you know, he really loved, you know, making, um, he loved making this stuff, you know. And the other thing, too, about the, the Taps record, too, is that, you know, Barbara Doust is a singer on My Forbidden Lover and on this song. She never performed with the act. They had a huge, huge falling out. And um, um, her vocal performances on these in a very, you know, uh, uh, you know, for Canada, an almost uh, evolutionary setting are, are amazing. I mean, and these are like one and two take vocals. And she could just go. I mean, for those of you who are making records now, you know, don't like the singer that's singing on your tracks. Love the singer that is singing on your tracks. If you have that kind of emotional connection that the song belongs to the singer when they sing it, it's going to fly. That's, I think, a big part of the reason that record did. When was this created? 1984. 1984. And, y like, you were just talking about the singer, so the, s the song is very important to you, right? Like, having a... Yeah, a like, full bloom. <laughs> you know, when we were uh, chatting yesterday and I was mentioning that, you know, um, there are some, uh, uh, there are some nights where you, you get into a club and you just leave because you don't hear enough songs. And, um, you know, having been a songwriter for 25 years now, I mean, I, I, um, song, uh, having something I can sing along with is, you know, that's, um, that's what makes it all work for me. It's not that I don't like the instrumental records. I mean, records like Magic Fly and Beyond the Clouds uh, and, um, you know, War Dance by Quebec Electric, or, you know, great electronic records or uh, Klein and MBO's Dirty Talk or things like that from Italy or uh, the Feel the Drive and, um, uh, by Dr. Cat. I mean, a lot of those records are really memorable, but, you know, to be able to sing along with somebody even if you have the worst singing voice in the world, which I do, uh, it, it, you feel a completely different connection. Um, it, you know, in, in my opinion, if you were, you know, if the song moves you, then, then you're, uh, 
then you've made the connection with the record and you'll play it again. I mean, uh, I was out last week and had to go and meet a writer and I had Linda Clifford and the first Village People record in my car for the day and it's really funny, you know, I live in Vancouver now and, and it's not exactly the disco capital of uh, the world and I just blasted the thing. I was just hammering it as loud as I could. I almost got a speeding ticket because I had San Francisco going so loud in the car. And I just said, you know what, I can remember everything. The other thing too, when you sing along with a record or when you first get something, you have a memory that's everlasting of going there to get it and how you got it and, and, um, and how much you paid for it, you know, and, um, and where you were and who you met. I mean, What's the most you ever paid for a record then? Well, I'm going to take you back like to 1978. Uh, today it would be, um, I guess, 50, it would be about 50 or 60 dollars comparatively in price. But, you know, we were paying 11 and 12 dollars for imports of Santa Esmeralda and Patrick Jouvet and anything that came from France. They were the most expensive uh, of all of them. Um, the most I've ever spent on a CD is I spent 40 dollars on uh, Cerrone by Bob Sinclair. Because I, you know, I've known Cerrone my whole life, and, and I think, you know, and Bob Sinclair really idolizes Cerrone, so I knew he wasn't going to screw it up. And the funny thing is, is that someone I knew from the start of my career was the salesperson, and I flew in from New York when I was working there. He said, "Man, you got to get this here," and I just I bought it, and I play it once, once or twice a week. But some of the stuff you still have in the house of your parents is worth. Uh, much more than forty dollars. So I'm finding out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was amazed with some of the people. So, so you kept all your records? Yeah, I have fifteen thousand pieces of vinyl, and um, I have a great uh, collection of disco compilations because you know disco means something different in Germany than it meant in England, and it meant something different in Italy than it meant here in Canada, and it means something completely different in the U.S. So, um, uh, as a songwriter and a music publisher today. Um, I, uh, I'm always looking for something special when I'm traveling, so my vinyl hound days have never left me. I'm just, uh, I'm always looking for something, and the compilations are all different in every country. I mean, the disco compilations in Sweden are completely different than the ones you get in Japan, which are unbelievable. So, you know, you, you end up, you end up uh, having, you know, I think I must have um, Earth, Wind, and Fire on like 35 different compilations. But I have a remix CD from Japan with all the songs remixed and the Jacksons all remixed. And, you know, those things are clever just to hear the reinvention of, of the classics, too. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Okay, then maybe slip on another plate of from your world of merry music. And thank you very much, Vince de Giorgio. Thank you. I'm gonna play this. Uh, the last, uh, the last thing I'm gonna play actually is, uh, is a, a record that Giorgio Moroder produced called uh, by a group called Sparks, and um, this uh, this record is very um, is actually very pivotal in, in the history of of disco music in this country because um, it was a record that nobody wanted to play because it was considered a little bit rock on the fusion side. But the DJs in Montreal made it a point to play this record to the point that Giorgio actually went in and remixed it. Now, I'm not sure if the two are interconnected, but it seemed ironic that after it became a record as a $60 import that nobody could find, uh, this, uh, this track called Beat the Clock by Sparks, which has one of the best mixing intros you'll ever want on a record. You know, the, the records that they were making in Montreal at that time were a lot more technologically advanced than what we were doing here in Toronto just because they, they really knew how to be great finishers. But for myself, as I mentioned before, I was a real disco snob. So for me, if the Italians made it, I was going to play it in a minute. And I think uh, the one record that I think is um, really telling and, and is probably my, my favorite record of that era um, is a record by uh, Revanche called Music Man. And um, it's um, because I think it's really the, the life story of the DJ.
um, and um, and it's Moro Malavasi, you know, the, and you're just in complete awe, you know. I wanted to make records like that. I I, ne I, I never I was able to, but I mean, it, it's something about having all the elements together, you know, great session singers from New York, um, like Bobby and Skip, who sang on this record, and Jacques Fred Petras, a great producer, and Malavasi, the god of the arrangers in Italy, and you know, musicians like Rudy Trevesi and, and Paolo Giannolo. We knew all their names. You know, if someone did a mix or somebody arranged something, we, we all knew it. And, and it was really unbelievable to listen to, to something like this and to see how incredibly it stands up, you know, to today's contemporary music. And the, the musicianship is just mind-boggling even just listening to it. You know, we're just lucky. And do you regret ending your active DJ career? Do I, do I regret ending my DJ yeah. career? You know, it's funny. I, I really haven't um, faced it until this week. It's really been something, you know. I've been, w you know, I have a mother who, uh, who has had 3,000 pieces of vinyl and wants to know when I'm getting them the hell out of her house. And uh, I've never touched them until this week. I mean, I don't own a turntable, but I'm really thinking of buying one now. You know, some, you, you, you know, you evolve and you, you move on. But, uh, no, you know, I'll tell you something. I, I, had, I had so much fun uh, when I was a DJ, and I absolutely loved it. Um, but I think uh, when I decided to let go, it's because I knew that um, there would be a chance to go out and hear somebody like Stonebridge or somebody like you or, or you know, uh, or some of the other people that I've been lucky enough to hear. As long as my, my heart is open to change, you know, I mean, I can do it again if I want, you know. Who knows? I, I'm, I'm never going to close that door. I mean, I'm going to be a DJ till the day I die. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. <laughs>